Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Not Overthinking. Taymor, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. We we don't have a massive amount of time, so we're just going to dive straight into it. Why don't we have a massive amount of time? Because you decided to not reply to my WhatsApp message. We were meant to start recording this 40 minutes ago. M like, 40 minutes ago, I messaged you saying, are we podding? Your WhatsApp message did not send. Yeah, somehow they didn't get delivered, and you were also nowhere to be seen. So then I did my poo, and then you had a shower. Yeah. And now here we are. Anyway, today... We are, we're going to read some highlights from a book called, uh, the book is called Why Love Hurts Okay. by a woman called Eva Illuz, something like that, probably butchering the, the surname. Um, I think this is quite interesting because firstly, it ties into um, a lot of the stuff from the rise and triumph of the modern self about how we sort of view selfhood. Um, and I think the, the other thing that's quite interesting about it is that we think that sort of, you know, love and relationships you know see if seem like they might be pretty you know timeless fundamental things you know like the way people feel about you know romantic partners and stuff like that that feels like the kind of thing that wouldn't change through time you know it's like um yeah it's just like it feels like this um you know just fundamental essential thing mm. um but it turns out that it changes a lot and uh, this, in, in this book, Eva kind of charts through like how romantic relationships and sort of romantic love have been viewed over the last sort of few hundred years. Uh, oh, interesting. In, in the West. So th this is it, like why love hurts a sociological explanation. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, all right, so let's get started. So this is going to be a short episode. It's going to be banger after banger of okay. highlights. Yeah, just like go for it. Yeah, I'm just opening it up, mate. While you're opening it up. I've just got this blog on this review on the LSE blog. Her premise is that the quest for love is an agonizingly difficult experience resulting in collective misery and disappointment, which is internalized by individuals, primarily women, as personal failing. The urgent sociological endeavor, she argues, is to relocate this individualized account away from the deficient psyches towards the, quote, set of social and cultural tensions and contradictions that have come to structure modern selves and identities. Here, Illuz adds a much-needed intervention, shedding light on how the personal and the social inter intersect in shaping the romantic self in late modernity. Love it, mate. Love it. She suggests that the individual navigates their way through complex social structures and institutions which frame the rules around and cultural, and cultural rituals of love, drawing on the resources which they have personally accumulated. It is this social psychic trajectory which Illuz posits as the modern condition of love, an experience that is shaped through inevitable suffering. Ah, uh, what? This is a long passage, but it's quite... Okay, I'm going to read. It's a long passage, but I think it sets the scene well. Um, so she talks a lot about um, classic books by, like, you know, the Brontes and stuff. And so she, she talks about Wuthering Heights to start the book. She says, Wuthering Heights, from 1847, belongs to a long literary tradition portraying love as an agonizingly painful emotion. Um, basically, there's two protagonists, Heathcliff and Catherine, they develop a strong love for each other while growing up together. But Catherine decides to marry this other guy, Edgar, who's a socially more appropriate match. Taylor's oldest time. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then, so basically, Catherine and Heathcliff love each other. Catherine decides to, regardless, marry the right, the right choice, Edgar. And, um, and Catherine says, uh, Heathcliff overhears Catherine saying that she would be degrading herself in marrying him. Oh, savage, savage, awful, poor guy. And then there's another, another book called Madame Bovary describes the unhappy marriage of a romantic woman with a kind hearted, but mediocre provincial doctor. Oh, in any such case, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just say words, uh, who cannot satisfy his wife's sappily romantic and social fantasies. It's eponymous protagonist, i.e. this Madame Bovary lady, uh, Thinks she's found the hero she's so frequently read and dreamed about in the figure of this other guy, Rudolf Boulanger, a dashing landowner. Mate, tale as old as time. Uh, after a three-year-long affair, they decide to elope. On the fateful day, Emma receives Rudolf's letter breaking off his promise. Yeah, basically, and she's really sad about this, and then there's a long description about how sad she is in, like, literary uh, sort of prose. Um and now we're back to Eva. Eva says, by our own standards, Catherine and Emma's pain seems extreme. Um, you know, Catherine is really sad because she ditched the guy she loved to marry the right guy, 
said a mean thing which the guy she loved overheard and now he's like run away and she's trying to find him mm. to make things right so she's sad about that uh emma is sad because she had an unhappy marriage with a kind of boring sort of nice guy and then she went away and eloped with um you know the more exciting romantic whatever guy mm. and then he broke off the whatever marriage engagement whatever stage they're at and then she's sad about it okay, okay cool um eva is saying that what this book the book that we're reading from seeks to claim is that the romantic agony that both of these women experience has changed its content color and texture First of all, the opposition between society and love which enacts in her, which each enacts in her suffering is hardly relevant to modern societies. Indeed, there would be a few, there would be a few economic obstacles or normative prohibitions preventing either Catherine or Emma from making their love their first and only choice. Um, you know, she's like part of like the situations that these two women are in is like the sort of social norms and um okay, maybe pressures or some things you're mm. like you know, marry the guy and, and you know the right guy socially for wherever you are or whatever yep. um if anything our contemporary sense of appropriateness would command us to follow the dictates of our heart not of our social media you know yeah if you're like if you don't like really love them or whatever like you got to follow your heart and like do what's right for your heart okay. etc um Second, a battery of experts would now be likely to come to the rescue of a hesitant Catherine and of Emma's passionless marriage. Psychological counseling, couples therapy, divorce lawyers, mediation specialists would massively appropriate and adjudicate over the private dilemmas of prospective or bored wives. Um, in the absence of experts' help, their modern counterparts would have shared the secret of their love with others, most likely female friends, or at the very least occasional anonymous friends found on the internet, thus considerably diminishing the solitude of their passion. Um, between their desire and their despair, there would have been a thick flow of words, self-analysis, and friendly or expert advice. Um, a contemporary, you know, if, if, these, if Catherine Rimmer were here today, they would have spent a great deal of time reflecting and talking about their pain and likely found its causes in their own deficient childhood. Classic. They would have derived a sense of glory not from the experience of grief, but precisely from having overcome it through an arsenal of self-help therapeutic techniques. Love it. Uh, modern romantic pain generates an almost endless gloss, the purpose of which is both to understand and ex extirpate. It's cause I don't know what that means. You know what extirpate means? To figure out. Dying, committing suicide, and running away to a cloister no longer belong to our cultural repertoires. This is not to say, obviously, that we post or late moderns do not know something about the agony of love in, fa in fact we may possibly know more about it than our predecessors but what it does suggest is that the social organization of romantic pain has changed profoundly um, this book is about understanding the nature of that transformation through an examination of the changes undergone in three different crucial aspects of the self okay mm. so this book is taking a look at how the way we feel in love and the way we think about love and ourselves has changed um, through three ways the first is the will which is about how we want something. The second is recognition, which is what matters for our sense of uh, worth. And the third is desire, so what we long for and, and how we long for it. In fact, few people living in the contemporary era have been spared the agonies of intimate, intimate re relationships. These agonies come in many shapes, kissing too many frogs on the way to Prince Charming, engaging in <laughs> Sisyphean internet searches, coming back lonely from bars, parties, or blind dates. When relationships do not get formed, agonies do not fade away, as one may feel bored, anxious, or angry in them. Um, you might have painful arguments, conflicts, go through confusion, self-doubts, and depression of breakups or divorces. These are only some of the ways in which the search for love is agonizingly difficult experience from which few modern men and women have been spared. Uh, despite the widespread and almost collective character of these experiences, our culture insists that they are the result of faulty or insufficiently mature psyches. So we're now coming to the, the, inner, the sort of inner psychologizing as the root of these issues. Okay. So the reason people struggle in love is because of their inner psyches. Well, that that that, that that's cut. Well, no, no. The, 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 the narrative today is that is that the cause of these relationship issues are internal within the individual. Um, countless self help manuals and workshops profess to help us better manage our romantic lives by making us more aware of the ways in which we unconsciously engineer our own defeats. The Freudian culture in which we're steeped 
has made the forceful claim that sexual attraction is best explained by our past experiences, early in life in the relationship between the child and its parents. For many, the Freudian assertion that the family designs the pattern of the erotic um, has been the main explanation for why and how we fail to find or sustain love. I mean, this, it's, it's just one of the narratives, right? It's like everything has everything, every, you know, like problem around this stuff today like that we have yeah. as adults is rooted in, in your, your childhood trauma or something yeah the reason you're going after partners that are not good for you is because the relationship you had with your dad the sort of love that they your parents made you feel was the sort of love that, yeah, yeah, like yeah. you're now craving as an adult yeah that's how that's how we think about this stuff and that that all okay. comes from Freud. undaunted by incoherence um freudian culture even further claims that whether our partner is opposite or similar to our parents he, is a, he or she is a direct reflection of our childhood experiences, as we just said, themselves the key to explaining our romantic destiny. Like the childhood experiences are the, are the key to explaining the romantic destiny. How, how much is that like actually, like I've, I've always been a bit, like is, is, is that like the classic narrative of like the reason I'm struggling in love is because of my childhood? No, no. I, it's I not, feel no, like no. that's almost. Interpersonal problems or like yeah. inter interpersonal problems, you know, preferences, hang up, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. I, I think today, it's basically a given that the reason is because of stuff that happened when you were younger. Mm. Okay. Um, anyway, I don't think that's like a major part of the point. Yeah. Freud went one step further and argued that early experiences of loss, however painful, will be reenacted throughout adult life as a way to gain mastery over them. This is a bit far fetched. I don't think this is part of the narratives, personally. Um, this idea had a tremendous impact on the collective view and treatment of romantic misery suggesting that it is a salutary dimension of the process of maturation. Um, what does salutary mean? Um, it's just like part of the, you know, it salutes the process. It's just like a marker of... Producing good effects. Beneficial. Um, a beneficial dimension of the process of yeah. maturation. Um, f more Freudian culture suggested that by and large, romantic misery was inevitable and self-inflicted. Okay, yeah, this is, this is a key thing. Although the original Freudian notion of the unconscious aimed at dissolving traditional authorial notions of responsibility, in practice, psychology played a crucial role in relegating the realm of the romantic and the erotic to the individual's private responsibility. Basically, anything in this, in this realm of the romantic and erotic is, an, is like an individual's private like responsibility. Whether, whether psychoanalysis or psychotherapy intended to or not, they provided a formidable arsenal of techniques to make us the verbose but inescapable bearers of responsibility mm. for our romantic miseries. You know, when we think about the realm of you know, romance, it's like all, you know, we're all like these individuals trying to, you know, perform our authentic selves. Yep in this sea of other individuals trying to do the same and any any problems that arise are down to like you know it's it's down to a, a problem with with the individual sure. and and the way you're thinking and the way you're feeling throughout the 20th century the idea that romantic misery is self-made was uncannily successful perhaps because psychology simultaneously offered the consoling promise that it could be undone so you know but, yeah, all, all of this kind of inner psychologizing really started in, in the 20th century okay. with For Freud and, and those guys. And and Jung, <laughs> that was a Jordan Peterson Peter impression. Yeah, nice, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, painful experiences of love were a powerful engine activating a host of professionals, you know, psychoanalysts, psychologists, etc. Um Right, this is, uh, this is my first actual highlight of the book. The extraordinary, su extraordinarily successful industry of self-help was made possible against the backdrop of the deep-seated belief that our miseries are tailor-made to our psychic history, that speech and self-knowledge have healing virtues. I mean, speech, self-knowledge, like talking about things, self-knowledge, introspection, this is like, you know, yeah, it is a given that I this, this is what, this is the path. This is the path. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. How dare you suggest otherwise? <laughs> the speech and self-knowledge have healing virtues. Okay. And that identifying the patterns and sources of our miseries helps us overcome them. Of course it does. Yeah, we're, we're yeah. obsessed with it. Well, well, the, I wouldn't say we're obsessed with it, but <laughs> it's like, you know, very reasonable. <laughs> the agonies of love now point only to the self, its private history and its capacity to shape itself. In the same way, here he's going, here he's going. That's a bit strong, but... Okay. Um, in the same way that at the end of the 19th century, it was radical to claim that poverty was the result not of dubious morality or weak character, but of systematic economic exploitation, it is now urgent to claim not that the failures of our private lives are the result of weak psyches, but rather that the vagaries and miseries uh, of our emotional life are shaped by institutional arrangements. So, you know, she's basically saying, look, at the end of the 19th century, 
it was radical to say like, look, this person, this person is homeless because of structural issues in society that they have been a victim of. Oh, that's right. At the end of the 19th century. Yeah. So the end of the 1800s, it was fashionable to say that people's circumstances were. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. Well, okay, well that's what yeah. you, that's what okay, you're cool. claiming. Like yeah. if you, you know, yeah. 1890, you see a homeless guy on the street, you think, man, this guy is, you know, he probably he had it coming. Yeah. He, he's, he's messed up. He, he flunked out of school. What an idiot. Kind yeah. Of dubious morality, weak character. Yeah. Like it's his fault basically. Yes. Okay. Whereas now yeah. when we think about that same person, it's like, look, the system sucks. Yep. This this person is a, a victim of the system. Of course. Like the system is, you know, the system is unfair. Yep. And like some people are homeless mm. through, you know, largely not that much fault of their own. Yes. Right. And she's saying that we need, we need that same shift when it comes to the realm of love. We need to, right now, if someone is, you know, if someone is unhappy in a relationship or something yep. or something, you know, romantic misery is yep. seen as like, it's obviously like your fault. Who else's fault can it be? It's like your feelings, man. Like <laughs> obviously, there's some like, you know, this is an internal issue within you. <laughs> and what she's saying is that we actually need to understand this as more of a systemic thing, where the system is set up in a way that reliably causes us to feel Ooh, these things. Nice. Okay, I get it now. That's um, interesting. Okay, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. The purpose of this book is thus to vastly shift the angle of analysis of what is wrong in contemporary relationships. What is wrong are not dysfunctional childhoods or insufficiently self-aware psyches, but the set of social and cultural tensions and contradictions that have come to structure modern selves and identities. Oh, okay. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, I'm looking at a blinker summary of this book, but it's not particularly, it's very surface level. Unfortunately, short form does not have one. Um, okay, so what blinker says is that, have, have you read the whole book? I have read maybe like half or oh, okay. third of it. So what, what Blinker says is, the key message in this book, finding love in the modern world can feel like a futile task. Women and men often have contradictory agendas, and the search for love is becoming increasingly rationalized through the advent of internet dating. Nonetheless, all people can build successful relationships with real commitment. I mean, that's okay, that's a stupid summary. But I think that's a stupid, yeah, I think I this is blink. very much going for like this, the self-help version of this. Yeah, I'm sorry, but Blinker is lack yeah. substance. You'll, you'll also learn why choosing a mate is like choosing a scoop of ice cream. Why men hold sway over the over the love women receive, Ooh. and how email, Skype, and Facebook make us fall in love with someone we've never met. Okay, yeah, this blinkers yeah, thing is this blinkers thing is trash. Like, yeah, sorry, blinkers mate. Trash. Um, this is why our channel is sponsored by Shortform these days. They do good. They go a bit more in depth, but they sadly don't have the summary. Okay, so it's like basically just a, trying to trying to make the case that. So having having read a third of it, have you do you do you buy it? Do I buy it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just facts. <laughs> it's just I mean, facts. it basically ex it explains how like our ideas around love and how it relates to the self. It just kind of charts how those have changed over the last few hundred years. By you know, you can look at like literature about relationships from like the eighteen hundreds or the seventeen hundreds, and you can see how how it's presented, and you can get a sense of like, oh, okay, back then, like if a guy rejected a girl like the thing that we're going through the girl's mind is this whereas today like what was the thing going through the girl's mind back then well <laughs> all right good question i mean we don't have time to read all the highlights yeah, but yeah, i just yeah. want your synthesis of like what's going on i mean basically the uh, i think one of the points that she makes is that romantic rejection today is seen as like a profound rejection of of one's authentic self indeed if, yes, if you yes, are rejected quite, romantically yeah. you're being every fiber of your being is basically being like rejected yeah. like it is it is a deep and profound reje rejection yeah. to and reject then there's all, all the self-help around is like trying to convince you that hey it's not me it's you it's like it's not you it's me it's like the circumstances don't take it personally all that kind of stuff yeah, yeah which yeah. people get a lot of solace out of right because rejection feels like a personal attack yeah, to the re core rejection feels like this really deep okay. thing so what did you and, feel like in these classic novels well but before that uh, i mean back in the day yeah romantic relationships were mediated by um by kind of social connections and sure. communities and expectations and things like that and so if it's like you know you didn't get your so i think today and i think i definitely felt this strong feeling growing up you are yourself is validated by romantic interest and romantic acceptance sure and you kind of you kind of need that in order to feel like you have the worth and so the worth is coming from outside mm. through this kind of you know 
the ro- romantic points or whatever. Yep. And that's what creates your worth. And that's what makes you feel like you're valued as an individual, valued by society, whatever. That, that, yep. That's a big part of like, am I, am I valuable? Am I worthy? You know, kind of me, you know, part, big part of that today is like, are people, you know, would, would someone be romantically interested in me? Okay, yeah. Whereas back in the day, the worth is more, allegedly, more like, intrinsic and inherent you kind of you know your worth and you're walking around knowing your worth and you know if someone rejects you or whatever like it's a bummer but it's it doesn't change your feeling of your worth whereas today you're trying to figure out your worth you're walking you're walking around the world you're not sure how much you're worth you're trying to figure it out based on the romantic interests or rejections that you're getting so is she saying that if you if like i mean i i once attempted to read wuthering heights uh and couldn't get more than a few pages through is she is she saying that like in these sorts of books reject romantic rejection is not seen as an assault on the self yeah oh okay. like the woman the woman would have a, a sort of a, a sort of clear and solidified co- concept of her her sort of worth yep and the romantic rejection wouldn't change that okay whereas today we don't have this clear and solidified sense of our worth and we rely on these romantic signals to help us define that and so if you get rejected a couple of times you're like shit i must be absolutely worthless mm. But but I swear. So so then in these romantic in these like old novels, why is why is love, why do, why does love hurt? Like why why is romantic rejection agonizing? Why is it agon? Oh, or or is the agonizing thing that like uh, Jane wants to marry John, but John is not of the appropriate social class, and therefore she feels compelled to marry Edgar. But Edgar is a bit of a it's it's, it's too much of a nice guy. <laughs> is that like um, what's going on here? I think so. I mean, I'd have to find the highlight. I, I, I if anyone, if anyone listening two, to this or watching this has read <laughs> books like uh, Wuthering Heights and Madame Bovary and stuff, if you wouldn't mind leaving a comment down below in the on the YouTube channel on the YouTube video to be like, what's actually going on here? Like, what is your synthesis of their portrayal of kind of why love hurts? That would be that would be interesting. Also, the uh, the chap we have editing this, Sam, studies classics, so maybe he will have actually read these. So we can classics. ask Sam. Yeah, yeah. I Sam think is studying classics means studying like the ancient Greeks. And I know it does, but like, <laughs> I feel okay. the sort of person who studies <laughs> classics is also possibly the sort of person who may have read Madame Bovary, given uh-huh. how famous the book is. We'll see, Sam. If you have, then uh, drop me a message on Slack, and <laughs> and you can let us know. Um, I'm trying to see if I can quickly find. Okay, no, it's there's too much stuff to go through. We'll just have to continue this next time, but it's it's really good stuff. Okay, cool. So it's like classic, not overthinking. We we read the preface of a book, and it's mm. like next time we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. discuss the rest of it. Yep, love it. Cool. Thanks everyone for listening. We got to leave now because we have rented this podcast room out to a friend of mine. <laughs> nice to try and the grind never stops. Exactly. More streams. Of Always income. be selling. <laughs> Always be closing. Absolutely. All right. Catch you guys later. Bye bye.